Hello, this is Billy Kaur from the Nostalgia Mall, and welcome to the Vintage Packard Bell Buyer's Guide. In this video, we're going to be taking a look at um, what to look for when you're wanting to buy a vintage Packard Bell computer. Why am I doing this? Well, um, I get asked a lot uh, of questions over the years of what to look for when you buy a Packard Bell, um, what's a good one, what to look for, um, is this um, the right one for me? and what do I do when I get it so um, I figured why not just make a, an in-depth video covering all I can on how to find a vintage Packard Bell what to do when you get a vintage Packard Bell and how to enjoy your vintage Packard Bell and I want to thank um, Perifractic's Retro Recipes for giving me the inspiration for this video um, he recently did a Commodore 64 buyers guide and when I saw it I was thinking you know what that gives me an idea for a video. So, anyway, um, we're going to be covering several things in this video. First, um, how to find one, and also how to uh, dis determine what kind of Packard Bell you want. So, um, first of all, I want to just um, explain what a vintage Packard Bell really is. Right here is an example of one. This is my Packard Bell Legend 1510 Supreme. I've had this for a very, very long time. It's a Pentium 120 with um, 16 megs of RAM, upgraded to 24, originally had a 1.2 gig hard drive, now has a 2 gig CF card, and is currently running Windows 95. Now, a vintage Packard Bell, um, when you get right down to it, is just nothing more than another x86 IBM clone from back in the day. It still um, uses Intel chips, it's still um, x86 compatible, DOS compatible, pretty much like any other uh, PC compatible at the time. But there are a few little things that make Packard Bells a little bit more unique, which we will cover in this video. So um, first I want to show you how to find a vintage Packard Bell of your very own. Okay, so you've decided to buy a mid-90s Packard Bell. First thing is you're probably wondering, uh, well, where do I find a mid-90s Packard Bell? Well, the first place you're probably going to look, going to want to look, is eBay. This is where you're going to find the most of them, and this is where you're going to get one the easiest and quickest way, even though you may have to, to pay a little bit more than you want. But... This is the um, best option if you're if you don't want to look too hard, and you want one right now. So um, right now I've got an eBay search up for Packard Bells under um, the vintage computers and mainframes category, and so um, there's 61 results um, for Packard Bells. Now in this video we're only going to focus on Packard Bells made between the years 1994 and 1997 because in my opinion um, this was Packard Bell's golden age and these are the ones that you're going to find that will be the most reliable but that's just my personal opinion so anyway let's take a look um, and see what we've got here now this is not a bad deal this is a Packard Bell legend 1824 CDT in a designer tower case now the first thing you want to do when you're um, looking at a Packard Bell is you want to see when it was built, um, kind of its birthday. How do you find out when a Packard Bell was built? Well, you're going to want to look at the back of it. So we'll take this um, Legend 1824 CDT for example. We'll just go to a picture of the back and you're going to want to look at the rear sticker that has the um, barcode on it and in this picture it is um, the one on the bottom left and this is a designer tower case by the way we'll take a closer look at the uh, main Packard Bell case designs um, later in this video but the way you can tell the date is to look at the um, number on the top right of the uh, label the one directly above the um, top barcode and in the, on this particular one, we see the numbers 10530. And how these date codes work is the um, middle number, which is the 5 in this case, 
is the last digit of the year the computer was manufactured. So in this case, um, it's a 5, which means it was built in 1995. And for the month, you're going to look, want to look at the far left part of the code, and we see the numbers 1, 0, which means 10 for October. And for the day of the month, you're going to want to look at the far right of the sticker, and in this case it says 3, 0, the 30th. So we can judge by this label that this Packard Bell was manufactured October 30th, 1995. And this rule applies for just about every Packard Bell made in this particular era. And as far as motherboards are concerned, the Packard Bells had many types of motherboards um, throughout this era. They had this particular one is the PB600 board. I can, I can tell from the uh, port layout on the bottom, the PB600 board has all the uh, ports all together. And this is the uh, motherboard that was in my childhood computer as well. And this particular sticker right here um, is on every Packard Bell you'll find, although it'll be a little bit different for each one, of course. This one says A950-TWR. This is just a fancy way of saying designer tower. And you'll also see a number um, right here where the FCC ID is that says 600. That means it's a PB600 motherboard. But anyway, as far as this particular Packard Bell is concerned, um, this is not a bad deal at all. We can see a picture of the um, BIOS post screen, which means it successfully completes its power on self-test. And we also see um, screens showing it booting into Windows 95 as well as it running Windows 95. And it currently has a uh, OS install on it, obviously. When you get it, you're going to want to wipe the hard drive and put your own personal copy of Windows on here. Um, I'll explain uh, installing Windows and the Packard Bell software in more detail later in this video. But we can see right here that it has what appears to be a 1.5 gigabyte hard drive. Currently has 16 megs of RAM. Um, that's probably the original to the system. And I can also tell by looking at this picture right here that it has the original Packard Bell sound modem card. And I gotta say, I'm actually kind of tempted by this as well. Um, looks like someone added a tape drive to this system. And um, it's a bid only right now, and the starting bid is $50, no bids. And of course, this is as of the recording of this video. And it has a shipping cost of $48.25. And we'll go down here, and there's some more info right here. Vintage Packard Bell Legend 1824 CDT. Um, not a whole lot of information right here. Um, but the seller has fairly good feedback. We'll go to um, look at some more listings. Here's another designer tower. This is a Packard Bell Multimedia D138. Now this one is nice because it still has the original spec sticker. Now this is something that I've always preferred having on a Packard Bell because it it really um, shows the originality of the system. And it also gives you a look at what the original specs of the system was. Um, in case the system has been upgraded in its life. This one originally had a 1.6 gig hard drive, a 133 megahertz Pentium, and 16 megabytes of RAM. And this motherboard right here is the PB680 Orlando board, which was a popular motherboard that Packard Bell used in the latter part of the year 1996 and throughout most of 1997. We can see the date code on this one as October 7th of 1996. Looks like the uh, original sound card is no longer in here. And it has, a, <laughs> of all things, a Gateway 2000 dial-up modem in there. That's kind of interesting. This one is $125 with $35 shipping. Honestly, this um, price right here is going to be pretty average. Of course, there's also the option to make an offer on it, but $125 is kind of the average asking price for these things these days. And we can keep going down. we got even more designer towers. Let's see if we can find something else. 
This one right here is a much later model Packard Bell. This is a uh, Multimedia 880 from um, probably late 1998. These I would not recommend getting. The quality on these is n very, very subpar. And we've got a Packard Bell Legend 3540 in a uh, 4x4 desktop case. I would um, not recommend getting this one unless you um, want it as a project box because this looks like it's missing a few parts like the floppy drive and CD drive. Although it still has the motherboard and a few cards in there as well. Can't tell if the sound card's in there or not. This was built February 20th, 1996, has the PB600 board. And yeah, it looks like there's no uh, sound card in here at the moment. But everything else is in there. Um, and this one's actually from North Carolina. This is not too bad if you want a little project box um, to restore. But there's no guarantee that it works because there's no uh, pictures of it doing a power on self test and the seller does not accept returns we can go down here and see it's some more info um, and um, it's untested and sold as is so um, you're taking a risk on buying this since you we don't know if it works or not but that is an option and it's only thirty five dollars and twenty five for shipping and I guess a lot of designer towers for sale right now. This one is an older Packard Bell. We're not focusing on this on these types at the moment, but this is interesting because it comes in the original box, um, which is really, really cool. This is a 386 base system, it looks like. And here's another 4x4 desktop. This is a Legend 68C Supreme, CD Supreme, I should say. The Supreme um, name tag on here, um, all that means is that it was originally sold at Sears. <laughs> so if you want a uh, Packard Bell and you want to say it came from Sears, well, there you go. This one was built um, April 4th, 1995. Uses the um, Robin board, which we'll take a closer look at later. And this one um, does have the um, power on self test pictured, so that's a good sign. It comes with a keyboard as well. We'll take a look at more of the accessories later. Now, the I'll, I'll go into more detail later when we take a closer look at a computer with this same motherboard, but this has the dreaded Dallas clock chip in it, and as we see in this picture here, it says CMOS battery failed. These are a pain in the butt to replace. Thankfully, this is the only motherboard Packard Bell ever had with a Dallas clock chip, so that's good. But if you do come across um, one of these with a Dallas clock chip and it's dead, um, there are ways to replace it, but you're going to have to do some pretty intense soldering to get that replaced. And there's no external battery header on these motherboards, so yeah, not a very good design there, Packard Bell. And we have a 486 system right here with a spec sticker on it. This is a Legend 204 CD. I actually have a 204 CD, a earlier one. Apparently they re-released it um, later in 1995. This was built um, September 15th, 1995. This is a 204 CD Plus. Mine's just a regular 204 CD. But we can see right here that it does boot to the BIOS, which is good doesn't have an operating system on there but you can always add one don't know if it has a hard drive or not um, but it does have one actually so that's good so if you want a uh, 486 that's um, that's an option although um, the price right here is a bit high uh, $250 plus $77 shipping but I think that's be I think that's just because this is being sold from California and it's calculating the shipping um, for if it was going to be sent all the way to me over here in North Carolina. So anyway, here's a mini tower, um, which is missing the front bezel on the bottom there. That's $180 and $85 shipping. Pretty expensive, unfortunately. 
but that happens. Now this is really cool. This is a Packard Bell Legend 415 CD in the original box with the original spec sticker on the box. It has a 75 megahertz Pentium, 1.2 mega, 1.2 gig hard drive, quad speed CD-ROM, 8 megs of RAM, and um, here it is right here. Not in the best of condition. Um, good bit of yellowing, but let's see if it works, and it does. Looks like it has a bad CMOS battery, and looks like another one that uses the Dallas clock chip, unfortunately. So, yeah, not wouldn't recommend this one just for the Dallas clock chip, which appears to be dead. And here's a uh, multimedia E153 in a mini tower case with a very busted looking CD-ROM drive. Has the spec sticker on it. Boots to the BIOS. Needs a new CMOS battery, but this particular motherboard uses a replaceable coin cell, so no big deal. This one was built January 17th of 1997. Now this one is special in that it has USB ports, which is really nice. And for some reason, it has two sound cards in it. So that's that's an option. And scroll down some more. We see a few more. And go to the last page here. And again, this is uh, there. There might be s an, some more Packard Bells, some different ones available for sale. Um, when you when you watch this video, so just search for Packard Bell on eBay and go to Vintage Computers and Mainframes. And there's also the option of checking your local Craigslist. Um, I did I just did a search a while ago for Packard Bells um, in the Greensboro area, but unfortunately, um, all that's available in my area right now is a Packard Bell typewriter. I have very, 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 very rarely ever seen any kind of vintage computer for sale on my local Craigslist. Maybe different in your area, so do keep a check for that um, on your local Craigslist. You might find a gym on there. And also check somewhere like the Facebook Marketplace. Also um, check your thrift stores. Um, not a lot of thrift stores these days sell um, old computers this old, but... Um, you never know until you try, so check for thrift stores in your area and you might find something. Now what you're looking at right here are the four most common Packard Bell case designs that you're probably going to be finding. Right here we've got the 3x3 desktop, which is the short one. The uh, 4x4 desktop, which is slightly bigger than the 3x3. And up here we have the two tower designs, this one being the mini tower and this one being the designer tower. And again, like I've said before, um, it can depend on um, your taste, which, what exactly you're looking for in a mid-90s Packard Bell and of how you want it to look. But a lot of times, when it's slim pickings, you pretty much got to take what you get, what you can get. So um, anyway, we're now going to take a closer look at each individual case style and show you what it's like. Okay, right here is a 3x3 three three Packard Bell case. This one in particular being a Legend 204 CD, a 486 system. This case is going to be your most basic of the Packard Bell cases and the smallest of the cases. You get, a, you get one 3.5 inch internal bay for a hard drive. You get one 3.5 inch external, external bay for a floppy drive. And you get one external five and a quarter inch bay for either a flop a five and a quarter inch floppy drive or a CD-ROM drive like I have here. Um, most likely you're going to be finding a CD-ROM drive in this kind of case. I've never seen a five and a quarter inch floppy in here but if you ask me if you're going to get one of these you're probably going to want to use a CD-ROM drive in here. So um, we'll flip it around and here's how it looks on the back. And I will um, take this apart so you can see the inside. But before I do that, I do want to show um, that the 3x3 case will give you three 
expansion slots. Um, this particular computer, since it's an older 486, is ISA only, um, industry standard adapter that is. And it's currently using the Packard Bell um, sound card. And to take this apart, you just, um, there are three screws um, on the left, on the top, and on the right. Already took the first one out on the left. Take this one out and on the top. And we'll take this one out on the right. I actually just had this open a while ago to put a CD-ROM drive in it. So <laughs> and the case just lifts off like so. Okay, um, here's the inside of it. Now this Packard Bell uses the older style Packard Bell sound card without the built-in modem. The uh, modem on this computer is actually on a little card right here. A little ribbon cable that plugs into the motherboard. Not that you'll be using a dial-up modem on one of these, but it's there if you need it. And the phone jacks are right there. And there's a wire going from it to the uh, sound card right here. Most Packard Bell sound cards from this time are going to have the modem built into this, so um, this right here um, will probably be quite moot to you. <laughs> and this motherboard is the PB450 uh, motherboard. This is um, Packard Bell's last 486 base motherboard. This um, is going to give you a built-in Cirrus Logic 5428 video chip, um, very common video chip. And here's the socket 3 um, with a 486DX2 clocked at 66 megahertz. And these boards come standard with 4 megs of memory built into it down there. I don't know if you can see it or not. And right here are two uh, SIM modules. This computer's been upgraded to 8 megs of RAM, which I think is what it came with originally. Now this motherboard originally had, I don't know if you can see it or not, amongst all these ribbon cables, right down in there used to be a tiny little coin cell battery that was soldered to the motherboard. That was the uh, CMOS battery for this computer. When I got this computer it was dead, so I had to clip it out with some wire cutters. And this computer is currently keeping its date and time and other BIOS settings with this uh, Tataram battery, which connects into a connector on the motherboard. Um, there are other options as well if you don't want to use the Tataram battery. You can also buy a AA battery container. I don't know if the container is the right word for that, but... You can plug your batteries, just regular AA alkaline batteries, and it will do that. You may have to solder to the board to do that, but I just found that using one of these is um, the safest option for me at least. And a good thing about um, these mid-90s Packard Bell's mo motherboards is they did not use barrel batteries on the motherboard, so you don't have to worry about um, battery leakage on these unless something really, really catastrophic happened with, this, with the coin cell. And there's the AT style power supply. This just uses a standard um, AT style power supply. And here's the drive cage. And in this particular case style, the um, hard drive, floppy drive, and the CD-ROM drive are all um, screwed into one cage. And I will show you how to remove that right now. Okay, first screw um, you're going to remove is this top one right here next to the floppy drive. And all the screws in pretty much any Packard Bell you're going to find are just going to be standard Phillips heads. Which is really nice, um, unlike Compaq, who always use the torque bits. And you're also going to want to remove this one to the right of the uh, CD-ROM drive that's uh, faced horizontally. I don't think I'd be able to do this with um, one hand though. There will also be a screw right here to remove a tiny little one that looks a little bit different from the other two, but I seem to have lost that screw, but 
it's not really necessary to have this screw in here anyway, so uh, if you lose it, no big deal. As long as you have the other two, you should be fine. Okay, with all the screws removed, you just take this cage right here, just pull under the uh, CD-ROM, like I usually, which is what I usually do, just pull it towards you, towards where the power supply is, I should say. Kind of push it in, and comes right out. And we can flip this um, over, and this is how you get access to the screws for the hard drive and the CD-ROM drive. And the screws for the uh, floppy drive are under it. You can't really see it on camera. One thing I forgot to mention, on some of the older systems, this one is uh, not one of those. Sometimes the CD-ROM drive, if it's the original drive, will connect into a proprietary connector on the Packard Bell sound card right here. So do be aware of that if you've um, got one of these. This one plugs into the, just the secondary IDE channel, which this motherboard thankfully has. So I'll go ahead and put this uh, back together. Now one thing I want to show is most of these Packard Bells have what's called accent panels. It's these little gray trim pieces that you find on the front and the sides of the computer. And what's unique about them is that you can actually slide them off. I don't know if I can do this one-handed or not. But Packard Bell did this because... You see how that came off. Packard Bell did this because they had an option at the time where you can buy uh, different color accents to uh, kind of uh, deck your system out in a way. So they had a blue, a red, and a green, I believe. Now, unfortunately, these are very, very rare to come across. Um, I almost um, got some a couple of years ago off of eBay, but I got outbid. So, um, these are going to be kind of hard to find, but anyway, just to let you know that is an option if you are lucky enough to find it. And that's the Packard Bell 3x3 case design. Again, very, very simple design here, but very quite fetching if you ask me. Okay, on to the next one. This is the 4x4 desktop design, which is quite similar to the 3x3, but there are a few key differences here, namely being the fact that this has an extra external 5 and a quarter inch drive bay, which will allow you to not only have a CD-ROM drive here, but you can also add in a 5 and a quarter inch optical drive, a uh, optical uh, disk drive, I mean, a, a second CD-ROM drive, or a zip drive and a five and a quarter inch adapter. So um, you do get um, a little bit more of an upgrade option if you need it, which is really, really nice. And you can probably see this one is quite yellowed. This is the uh, legit, not legit, the uh, Force 102 CD. Flip it around. And Unlike the 3x3, you get an extra expansion slot, so you've got four expansion slots here, which is really, really nice. This system uses the uh, Robin board, the 520R, I believe, or it might be the 540R, I can't remember. This is a Socket 5 Pentium, built in early 1995, no, actually built in late 1994. So this is actually the oldest Packard Bell I have in my collection at this time. Now, um, what's interesting about this system is, is that it didn't have a modem, but it did have um, the Packard Bell sound card without the modem, which is kind of odd, so I guess maybe this didn't come with a modem originally. So, to take this one apart, it's um, pretty much the same as the 3x3. There's a screw on the left, right, and top. You just take them out. There's currently not one on the top at the moment. So, pretty straightforward. Again, all Phillips head. So, take this off. And we're in.
OK right here. Um, we'll take a look at the motherboard. Um, this is the only motherboard of this type I've ever had. This is the uh, Socket 5 with a Pentium 90 megahertz. And right here is um, the Cirrus Logic 5434 chip, which is extremely common on these early Pentium Packard Bell systems. Now, I forgot to mention, this goes the same with the 5428 in the last one we saw. This, these usually came with one meg of video memory, but there are these little um, sockets right here where, where you can add um, um, video RAM chips to upgrade it from one to two megabytes of video memory. I'm not exactly sure what kind of chips you need, but um, that's an option if you need extra video memory without going to a new video card. And right here, um, this particular system has one, two, three ISA slots along with two PCI slots, although one of these PCI slots is shared with the ISA slot. And this also has, I believe, either four or eight megs of memory built into the system. I haven't turned this computer on in a long time, so I forget what it's been upgraded to, but there's two SIM modules there. Now the big Achilles heel to this particular motherboard is the fact that it uses this Dallas clock chip. And, and this is the only Packard Bell motherboard I know of that used this. These things are notorious because they, they are soldered to the motherboard and when they die they are very, very difficult to replace. You've got to desolder it from the board and solder a new one in. This, that is, if you're able to find a new Dallas clock chip. Um, thankfully, by some miracle, last time I used this computer a couple of months ago, the, the clock chip still worked. But I know that it is probably on borrowed time, seeing that this computer is almost 25 years old. So that's a big thing you want to keep in mind if you find a Packard Bell with this particular motherboard in it. And um, like the 3x3, the drive cage is very, very similar. You get a screw here, smaller screw here, and a regular size screw here to uh, remove the uh, drive cage. Um, I won't show it on this case because it's the uh, pretty much the exact same thing as the last one, but except the fact that you've got a... Uh, five and a quarter inch drive bay under here, an extra extra one so you can add a second five and a quarter inch drive and that screws into the bottom of the cage. So, um, that's the uh, 4x4 desktop style. Let's move on to the next one. This right here is the mini tower design. And it also happens to be my childhood computer, the Packer Bell Legend 822 CDT. And this is probably going to be the most common tower design you're going to find. It's also quite expandable because um, you get your external three and a half inch drive bay right here. You get a uh, you get three five and a quarter inch external bays right here, so you can add not only a CD-ROM drive, but you could put five and a quarter inch floppy drive right here and a zip drive with a five and a quarter inch adapter right here or um, wherever you want them but the option is there which is really really nice and you can't see it just yet because I don't have it open but you also get two internal three and a half inch drive bays now actually I just remembered we're not going to be able to see that in here because I took the drive cage out because I'm using a CF card in this computer. But just so you know if you find one of these and it still has a drive cage in it you'll be able to add two full size hard drives in here. And we'll flip it around. And we get a plethora of expansion slots. We get one, two, three, four, five, six. Six expansion slots. That's two more than the 4x4 desktop we just saw. I currently have the uh, Packer Bell Sound and Modem card in here. This is one that has the modem built in. Have the CF card adapter right here and a network card right here. And if you're uh, 
Mini Tower is like the uh, 204 CD 3x3 we just saw a while ago. It may have a modem somewhere in one of these two slots right here. Now, to open the Mini Tower, well, it's a little bit more convoluted than the desktop models. You actually have to flip it upside down where you will find one, two, three, four, five, six Phillips head screws to remove. Now if you're only going to remove the um, this side right here, you only have to remove um, this, 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 and this, and you can just keep these screws in place right here. But if you are going to remove this side, you will have to take these screws out. You need to remove this if you're going to be working with the five and a quarter inch bays. So we'll go ahead and uh, unscrew this. Okay, I took the screws off camera. And this first panel right here on this side is what you remove first because it's actually part of it's actually sitting on top of this panel right here, if that makes sense. So this can be a little tricky to get off. Sometimes I have to use a flathead screwdriver to pry into here and lift it up. And sometimes these rubber feet like to move over the years and block this. <laughs> so that's not fun. Okay, I did have to take a flathead screwdriver to move this away from that rubber foot, but there we go. That's that panel removed. And to remove this one, you just lift it up like so. And we can flip it back around. Actually, no, let's just lie it on its side, shall we? Okay, I got it flipped over so we can take a closer look at the inside. There's our uh, drive bays. There's the where the CD-ROM is. This is where you would add the two additional five and a quarter inch drives. And the floppy drive is right down in there, although you do have to take the uh, front panel off to get to it. And this is where the hard drive um, caddy would go, but I don't have it in here at the moment. But again, this would give you two um, slots for a full-size hard drive. Um, move down here. We can see the uh, expansion slots on this system. If it's a Pentium that is like this, you will get one, two, three ISA slots along with three PCI slots, um, which is being shared with one of the ISA slots. And here's the uh, Packard Bell sound modem card. Um, some of these will look a little bit different from other Packard Bell sound cards, but they work exactly the same and most use the same software as well again I don't really I don't ever use the modem on this though just the sound portion of this and you can if you want you can remove these sound cards and put just a generic sound blaster card in here and that would work but I tend to not do that I like to keep these systems original plus these sound cards um, despite popular belief are actually quite compatible with many many DOS games this is uh, Sound Blaster Pro compatible so you get that kind of compatibility with these cards which is really really nice and right here is the uh, very dusty uh, Socket 5 this is a Pentium 100 sitting under that and this is the PB600 motherboard this is a very very common motherboard that you're going to find and you get um, several SIM slots right there. This currently has 32 megs in it. And right there is the coin cell battery, which is actually soldered to the motherboard. But the thing about this um, computer is, is that, or these, this motherboard actually, I've never seen a PB600 motherboard before that didn't have a working clock battery. These clock batteries seem to last forever. So if you see one of these, more than likely it's still going to be working, but if by some chance it's not, then just like the uh, 486 board we saw a while ago, there is a header on here to install an external battery. So that option is there. And again, this is a Cirrus Logic 5434 video chip. There's our expansion slots here again for video memory. 
Again, uses AT power supply. And there's the fan. So, um, that's pretty much all there is to see in here. I'll go ahead and uh, put the cover back on. Obviously, um, I, this is my favorite of the case styles, mainly for nostalgic reasons. So, I'll go ahead and put the, the covers back on. I also want to briefly mention that the screws that are um, holding these side panels on are actually a special size. You um, it can't really use a standard size uh, screw on these like this. So um, if you somehow happen to lose the original screws for this case, this is um, what you need to find. Um, I just got these at Lowe's Home Improvement. This is the uh, size right here. Just pause if you want to read this. And that's a look at the Mini Tower Packard Bell, which is one that you'll find quite frequently. I quite like it. It's uh, very simple looking, but still has a very, very um, classy look to it, especially with these accents right here. So, on to the final one. Right here is the second um, case style that you'll probably find the most frequently for a Packard Bell. This is called the Packard Bell Designer Tower. And this was Packard Bell's probably finest, um, classiest, and most interesting looking case design they probably ever had next to the corner desktop, which I'll mention um, later. Uh, like the uh, mini tower, you get three external five and a quarter inch drive bays. Now, I do want to mention something about these drive bays. They use special drive rails. So, um, don't ever, ever lose the original drive rails that come with the CD-ROM drive in this, because you will need it. So, the big problem with this case design is really it's kind of hard to uh, add extra five and a quarter inch um, drives here, because you need those special drive rails, which is a big pain in the butt, but that's, that was Packer Bell's doing, not mine. And you also get your three and a half inch um, floppy drive right here. Flip it around. Like the mini tower, you get um, six expansion slots right here. I actually have a SD card adapter sticking out of one of these. I pretty much um, hot rod this one a little bit. I added a um, a Voodoo one to this, as you can see right here with the. Uh, pass-through cable. So, um, take this one apart. It's a lot more simple than the mini tower, thankfully. There's a, a screw right here, a screw right here, and a screw up here. So we'll just go ahead and remove these. And we can get inside. slow down. <laughs> and it just slides off like so. And we can take a look inside. Okay, over here we got our expansion slots. Um, it has the uh, same number as the uh, mini tower. This particular computer, by the way, is the Platinum Pro 22. You'll most commonly see this uh, case design with the Platinum and Platinum Pro series, but you'll also find it on other uh, models as well. And there's the Socket 5 again. This one has a Intel MMX Overdrive chip, which I added myself. Um, this will pro you probably not come with one when you get it. And over here, we get the uh, hard drive um, slot, which is currently empty because I'm using an SD card adapter. Unlike the mini tower, though, you only have access to uh, you can only ac you can only install one hard drive in this system, which is surprising considering this is the more uh, um, top of the line case design. <laughs> but anyway motherboard down here. This is the uh, PB640 motherboard. 
which I don't think you can see it, but down there has a uh, coast module for um, for cache memory. Now to get to the um, five and a quarter inch drive bays right here, um, I'll have to show you in a moment. You're going to have to take this uh, front panel off, and which we'll do right now. Now on each side of the face plate, when you take the cover off, that is, there's going to be uh, a screw here, and you can't see it, but there's also a screw on the on the um, opposite side. Just unscrew them again. It's just standard Phillips. And we'll unscrew the other one. Just take my word for it, there is a screw back here. And you're also going to want to um, unplug the LED connections to the motherboard, which um, I'll do right now. Probably didn't see that. And it just comes off like so. And you can also see the uh, kind of the drive rail right there for the optical drive. I will unplug the optical drive actually just so you can take a better look at the drive rails. The uh, Olex power is in there pretty tight. There we go. And you just press on right here and it slides right out. And here's what the, uh, the uh, drive rail looks like. There's one on each side. Again, you never ever want to lose these because these are very, very hard to come by. And just put it back in, it just slides in. Just push it in until it snaps. And to uh, a lot of times to get to the IDE cables back here and other parts of the system that are covered that the motherboards covered with by these uh, panels right here you're going to want and this is I think a pretty stupid design choice if you ask me first you're going to need to take off this uh, little piece right here and to do that you need to take a flathead screwdriver and under here is going to be a little opening you want to kind of wedge the screwdriver in. Actually, there's two smaller openings right here, one on each side. You want to kind of wedge the screwdriver in and pry, carefully that is, and this should come right off. And when you take that off, you get access to two more Phillips screws right here. We'll just uh, take this one off, since this is the one that's covering the IDE connectors. This will probably be the one you'll most frequently be removing. And I dropped the screw nice. <laughs> and voila. Slides right off. Same with the uh, other one. And that gives you easier access to the IDE connectors right here. One thing I forgot to mention about this particular motherboard, the PB640, like other motherboards from this time, it's going to have a removable CR2032 battery like any other motherboard would, which is um, quite an improvement from the other ones that have to uh, be desoldered, so that's a very good thing to have right there. And that's the Packer Bell Designer Tower. Very, very nice looking uh, machine, I have to say. Um, it really, really set, does set Packer Bell apart from the other com computer manufacturers of its day where the computer designs, the case designs, were just very, very white box generic looking. Just set it up to next one of these and you'll see quite a contrast. So anyway, that's the four most common case designs you're going to see from Packer Bell. I didn't mention the other two, which were the... Uh, um, corner desktop, which I do have, but it's currently in storage, waiting a new power supply. And the uh, Sonera, uh, not Sonera, the, uh, that's the refurbished um, uh, line of Packard Bell systems. And you're also going to find the uh, Packard Bell all-in-one desktop, which was called the uh, Spectria. Most of them were called Spectria, at least. And this was pretty much a 3x3 desktop with a 
CRT monitor permanently attached to it and I have been wanting one of those for many many years I have not been able to find them I think they're even more rare than the corner desktop so um, neither of those the corner desktop or the all-in-one you're probably going to be finding um, easily so um, that's why I just showed these four case designs because these are the four that you're going to see most commonly okay now's the time we need to start talking about software now the operating systems that came with these um, Packard Bells the particular era we're talking about you're either going to find Windows 3.1 um, or I should say uh, Windows for Workgroups 3.11 or Windows 95. Those are the two that you're going to find on them uh, most commonly for um, the ones that came pre-installed. Pre of course they could have been upgraded at some point to a newer operating system but typically you're going to find Windows for Workgroups 3.11 or, or Windows 95. Some of them, some of the models came with, with um, either or such as the uh, Packard Bell Legend 822 CDT we saw earlier some models came with Windows 3.1, others came with Windows 95. Um, it just depends on which one you would prefer running. Now, I get a lot of um, questions um, asked involving um, upgrading um, these Packard Bells to something like Windows 98, Windows ME, Windows 2000. And unless you're running a MMX-based CPU or higher, I do not recommend doing that at all. While something like Windows 98 will um, will install just fine on a Pentium 100 or similar, it's not going to run um, reasonably well. Not well enough to use it for um, everyday tasks, um, including gaming. So. I suggest sticking with Windows 3.1 or Windows 95 on the non-MMX based uh, Packard Bells. Once you get to the MMX based CPUs, um, you can run Windows 98. Um, it won't, won't run quite as well as 95 um, in my opinion, but um, if you want to put Windows 98 on there, um, go right ahead. Of course, um, it's um, if you want to keep the Packard Bell software on there, you'll probably want to do an in-place upgrade. Uh, more on the Packard Bell software in a moment. In fact, we'll discuss that right now. Packard Bell was known for having um, different types of um, software bundles. And what you're looking at right here are the two most common software bundles that you would get with a Packard Bell. On the left, you have the 1994-1995 pack. And on the right, you have the 1995-1996 pack. The um, two Packard Bells that we saw earlier that would use the 94-95 pack on the left would be the um, Legend 204 CD, the 486 system, and the um, Force 102 CD, the Pentium 90 system. So, again, um, to determine what software pack your, your Packard Bell would have come with, you um, you just need to refer to the um, date of manufacture of your Packard Bell that we discussed earlier. So um, first, let's take a look at the uh, 9495 bundle and see what you get. Now, this isn't everything that's um, that would have come with this. Um, this is just um, what I happen to have um, in my collection at the moment. Here is the Master CD, the multimedia pack. You would get the um, Knowledge Adventure um, DOS games, including um, Speed, Space Adventure, Undersea, Undersea Adventure, Kid Zoo, 3D Dinosaur Adventure, and probably the most famous of these, um, the 3D Body Adventure. You also get Mega Race, which is a really cool little um, full motion video racing game. Uh, Grolier Multimedia Encyclopedia the Software Toolworks World Atlas and you get a couple more um, like the uh, 1994 um, uh, uh, ESP, not uh, Sports Illustrated um, Almanac my mind went completely blank there and you get a couple of others now for the 9596 pack the one I'm a little bit more familiar with you get Silent Steel Nav Navigator CD there. More on Navigator in a moment. 
My First Encyclopedia and Spider-Man Cartoon Maker. A CD which includes the uh, Mayo Clinic Family Health Book. A demo for Jumpstart Kindergarten. Reader's Digest, Multimedia Crosswords. And my personal favorite on this disc, the Active Imagination Kid Story Games, which includes The Pirate Who Wouldn't Wash and Millie Fitzwillie's Mouse Catcher. Toon Land, a fun little point-and-click game for children. The uh, 1995 Multimedia Disc of Records. The uh, 1995 Sports Illustrated um, Almanac, along with the um, Mindscape Complete Reference Library, Mayo Clinic Family Health, and Better Homes and Gardens Healthy Cooking CD Cookbook, among uh, a few others. Oh, and you also get um, Encarta 95 for Microsoft. Now for Master CDs. What is a Master CD? Well, the Packard Bell Master CD is the Restore CD that would have come with your Packard Bell originally and it basically um, restores a factory image to the Packard Bell. Of course there are versions for um, 3.1, 95, and even 98. Um, those are the much later ones of course. And to determine which Master CD your Packard Bell would have come with, well that's a little difficult. Um, to be fair, you could um, many Packard Bells could use different types of Master CDs. I'll uh, show you a few as an example. This is um, what a Windows 3.1 based Master CD would look like. It would, it would say Multimedia Master CD. This is 170210 Revision 1. That's from 1994. Um, I also forgot to mention that the 9495 software pack was um, Windows 3.1 only, but the um, 9596 pack, um, there were some machines that came with that with Windows 3.1, but for the most part that would have been Windows 95. And these two right here are Windows 3.1 um, Restore CDs, Master CDs, which include the 9596 software pack. And by the way, there is a link on um, archive.org that has all pretty much most of these that you're seeing right here for download. And this is what a typical Windows 95 Master CD would look like. So to determine um, which Master CD is uh, most appropriate for your system, just go by the date on the rear sticker of your Packard Bell, take that date, um, write it down, and put one of these uh, Master CDs in your drive, and just look at the um, modified dates on the files on it, and pretty much just try to find the Master CD with modified dates um, closest to the, to the date of the manufacture date of your Packard Bell system. That's just how I recommend doing it. Now um, you could also forego all of this and just put a plain vanilla copy of um, Windows 3.1 or 95 on the Packard Bell. Nothing stopping you from doing that. But what you will miss out on is the ability to have all the drivers working out of the box. Um, Packard Bell systems are a little bit notorious for not having um, easy to find drivers, especially for the sound card. And you won't get um, Navigator or any of the uh, software that would come with your Packard Bell. So um, it kind of, um, skipping all of the um, Packard Bell software, it kind of takes away from the Packard Bell experience in my opinion, so I highly recommend um, putting the Packard Bell software on your um, Packard Bell just to make it more authentic. Now there is one more thing I want to mention about the Packard Bell software bundles. In late 1996, Packard Bell split up their model line into the Multimedia series and the Platinum and Platinum Pro series. And both of these series had their own unique software bundles. The Multimedia Pack um, still kept the 1995-1996 um, bundle that we just saw a while ago on video. 
whereas the Platinum and Platinum Pro bundle, well, it, it had a more enhanced software pack, including a newer version of Navigator, which we'll look at later. And some of the software that you would get on this would be um, uh, America Online again, um, you get SimCity, uh, SimCity Classic that is, the little engine, Echo the Dolphin, the PC port of that, um, Comic Zone from Sega, uh, among many, many others. Um, it's pretty much completely different from what we just saw a while ago. So, um, yeah, that's an option if you uh, come across one of these particular Packard Bell models. But anyway, let's move on to taking a look at Packard Bell Navigator. Okay, now I want to go over the uh, three main versions of Navigator that you're going to find. Now, what is Navigator? Well, Navigator was a um, graphical user interface um, that Packard Bell shipped on top of Windows 3.1 and 95 on their new systems back in the mid-90s. You see, at the time Packard Bells were being made at this time, people were still trying to figure out how to use a computer. So, it, uh, the um, interface of um, Windows, both 3.1 and 95, was kind of a foreign concept to people. And so, to try to help ease people into um, using a computer, Packard Bell included um, Packard Bell Navigator, which um, used a house metaphor, um, for the most part, on most of the versions, it was a house metaphor. And it was, because uh, people... Associ would, it, would, be, would be able to associate stuff with rooms with a house, like you had the living room for all your home electronics, um, like your computer CD player, the info room with uh, with uh, your <coughs> the info room with access to your computer manuals and access to the um, to online services like Prodigy, CompuServe, America Online and the software room which has access to the software that came with your Packard Bell as well as software that you've added to that room yourself. So, um, Navigator really is part of the Packard Bell experience and I highly recommend having it on a, compu on a Packard Bell computer. So, right now what we're going to do is we're going to take a look at the uh, first version of Navigator that you'll probably be um, seeing. This is Packard Bell Navigator 2.0, and this is the version of Navigator that came on Packard Bells with the 1994 and early 1995 software pack that we saw earlier in the video. Okay, let's go ahead and hope. Let's go ahead and open up Packard Bell Navigator. This is version 2.0. Get a cool little intro sequence. Welcome to Packard Bell's Navigator. Welcome to the main menu of Navigator, the easy way to get to know and use your Packard Bell computer. Explore the functions of Navigator by using the mouse or the tab or arrow keys on your keyboard. So yeah, this earlier version of Navigator uses a more button style metaphor for um, accessing your applications. Like um, the Learning Center right here takes you to the uh, tutorials for your computer. The uh, software button um, does what it says on the tin. It takes you to your software on the computer. With, um, different categories there. And both, uh, and all versions of Navigator come with something called Kid Space and Workspace. Workspace is um, just a little place for for working and having and keeping all your documents together. And later versions of Workspace also had a uh, house metaphor, which we'll see later. Go back to Navigator. And Kid Space is kind of the same idea, but for kids. And this stayed roughly the same throughout most of um, Navigator's history. Hello, and welcome to Kid Space. This is the fun place to work and play. We'll shut him up for now. But this is Kid Space. Um, you get access to different types of games and applications in here as well. And that's frightening, but that's uh, these little uh, filing cabinet places right here where you can put your uh, documents. And we 
we go back to Navigator, and um, this version of Navigator does have a different type of interface you can switch to by clicking this tiny little button on the bottom left. And you get this hallway which gives you access to the same things we saw earlier. So um, yeah, that's Packard Bell Navigator 2.0, a little bit more primitive than what I'm used to. But that's what came on Packard Bell systems from 1994 and early 1995. Okay, we've moved over to Windows 95, and we're going to take a look at the more common version of Navigator that I'm more familiar with, and I'm sure a lot of other people who had Packard Bells back in, in this time were, were more familiar with. This is Packard Bell Navigator version 3.5, and we'll go ahead and open it up right here. Welcome from Packard Bell. We offer you two computing environments to choose from, Packard Bell's Navigator or Microsoft Windows. You may also begin by taking a quick lesson on using the mouse. So yes, this is the uh, version of Navigator that was infamous Welcome for its... Welcome to Navigator's living room. Thank you. This is the version of Navigator infamous for its mouse lesson. Um, I'm not going to show that in this video, but I have done videos about it in the past if you want to check those out. So um, in this version, um, this really does go full force with the house metaphor. You start out with the living room, which gives you access to your various ele uh, various electronics, such as um, CD player, which opens up audio station. Um, I do not want to know why the Windows 95 chord sound um, was playing in that key. I am very scared now. <laughs> By the way, this is being emulated in PCM. And you get access to the media controller. In this box right here, you click it and it will let you register your Packard Bell. But of course you need the Navigator CD. And you get a button here to adjust your clock settings. And here's the software room that I mentioned before. You get multiple categories for the types of software you get. Again, this is the 9596 software pack this came with. So you get Microsoft Works there. There's your Mayo Family Health Book. And Carta 95. All the Microsoft Entertainment Pack games, including the Journeyman Project. Communication tools. And some other little utilities. And over here is the info room, which gives you access to uh, the manuals that came with your computer, as well as the navigator tutorials, which require the CD, and access to various um, online services, including America Online, CompuServe, and Prodigy. And if you click this button right here, you get a bird's eye view of the navigator house. And I've said this before, and I'll say it again. Uh, there's a big reason why I do not want to live in this house. There's no bathroom. Seriously, how are you supposed to use the restroom if there's no restroom to use the restroom in? <laughs> Just a funny little observation I've made over the years about Navigator. So, um, that's Navigator 3.5. There's also a version called Navigator 3.6, which is mostly identical to what we're seeing now in 3.5, but it adds a couple of more um, internet related features but that's about it so let's head over to the next version of navigator that you may come across okay the um, last version of navigator um, at least in the united states where it was available was navigator 3.9 and despite it being part of the 3.x series it is a uh, big step up from 3.5 and 3.6 like we saw earlier. This is um, pretty interesting. Check this out. Your Packard Bell computer offers two computing environments to choose from. Our Navigator Home Environment or Microsoft Windows. Press button number one to go directly to Navigator or button 2 to go to Windows 95. Press button 3 for an overview of Navigator. 
Press the number 3 key on your keyboard for a quick lesson on using your mouse. To customize your setup and secure your computer so that more than one person can use it, press button 4. So yeah, um, you can already tell that this version of Navigator is quite a big difference from what we saw earlier. Um, the uh, house environment has completely been redone. Now normally there would be more um, buttons here for the home electronics like you saw in 3.5, but on this particular machine I don't have those installed, so they don't show up here. But you, instead of a software room, you get a software shelf. Again, um, I really don't have anything installed on here, so, um, but just take my word for it, on a full copy of um, a Packard Bell install that would have this, there would be software here. And you also get the uh, info room, which looks quite a bit different. Right here is where you get your manuals, like before, and right here is where you get um, access to your online services if they were installed. And right here is the tutorial wall like we saw before, but in a different location. Now Planet Oasis, you keep seeing this, you probably keep seeing this icon here. That was Packard Bell's um, 3D online environment designed for kids that they had back in like uh, late 1996, early 1997. Didn't really catch on, but for obvious reasons it's not really accessible anymore. And you still get access to uh, kid space and workspace. And by the way, I forgot to show what workspace looked like in 3.5. But it looked pretty much um, quite similar to this, um, as you see in 3.9, except a little bit different. And you still get kid space, but you also get a new location called MySpace. And this has nothing to do with the social networking site from the 2000s. <laughs> Hello, and welcome to MySpace. This is the cool place to work and play. Keep your software in the bookcase. Put all your games and stuff on the shelves. To start your software, drag things from the shelves to where I'm standing. Keep all your files and letters in the dresser drawers. And if you want to enter the exciting world of the Internet, pull down the lever under the window. Click anywhere on the window area and be transported to a whole new online dimension. Now if you need more help, click on the box with the mouse. So what are you waiting for? Start exploring and have fun! So as we can see here, I, I believe this is um, pretty much kid space but for um, older children. Does ex the exact same things, just a different looking environment. A little bit more cooler looking, I guess you could say, for um, older kids. And you can even scroll a little bit. <laughs> that was kind of creepy. And you, um, you may have saw an icon there, but you can also set up uh, multiple users on this version of Navigator, which is pretty cool. So... Anyway, that's um, all the versions of uh, Packard Bell Navigator, so let's uh, move on, shall we? Now, there's one more lesser-known version of Packard Bell Navigator, and that's called Packard Bell Navigator Assistant. You see, in 1997, Microsoft changed their OEM licensing to where you could no longer have alternate GUIs on top of Microsoft Windows. So that pretty much spelled the death of Packard Bell Navigator. So to um, remedy this, Packard Bell came up with something called Packard Bell Navigator Assistant, which took all the main functions of Packard Bell Navigator and compacted them into a little toolbar that would sit on the bottom right corner of the Windows desktop. And um, to be honest with you, it's really not nearly as interesting as um, Real Navigator, but this is what would come on certain Packard Bells from... Uh, 1997 up until the time Packard Bell left the US market. Not a very good picture right here, but I hope it gets the point across. Okay, now we need to discuss accessories. You've got your Packard Bell, but how do you accessorize it with um, the various peripherals that would have come with a Packard Bell back then, of course? I recommend getting yourself a good Packard Bell keyboard, like this one right here. Um, these use uh, 
cherry switches actually so these have a very very good typing feel I'll open up a word document here they're kinda clicky which is really really nice so even if you didn't have a Packard Bell and you come across one of these keyboards I'd recommend getting them it's a uh, PS2 based so pretty easy to uh, use on just about anything and you may also want to consider getting yourself a Packard Bell mouse like this this is um, pretty much the standard Packard Bell mouse that came with these there's the model information right there this particular example is a little um, banged up but it gets the point across and of course these were famous for uh, their wavy button designs <laughs> and like the keyboard this is PS2 based now some Packard Bells came with something called a fast media remote and what this did was basically um, allow you to control your various Packard Bell media functions from a standard remote control it takes uh, I believe two AA batteries and you get functions for CD telephone um, answer machine volume and if your Packard Bell has a TV card um, controls for that as well and it has this little IR sensor that plugs into the serial port and these are very very easy to get a hold of um, they're dirt cheap on eBay most of them are still new in the box and you can even control the mouse with this remote control you get this little button right here moves the uh, cursor and this is your left and right click so yeah must have for any P Packard Bell collector another good accessory to get is the Packard Bell microphone the microphone um, connects into the mic in jack on any sound card and it sets in this uh, lovely little base can't do that one handed it seems but yeah this is also must have the audio quality isn't the best but that's pretty much to be expected from a microphone this age but again um, this can be had for quite cheap on eBay highly recommend getting one of these now this one is a little bit more obscure this is the Packard Bell Media Select this is placed under your monitor and it gives you um, controls just like you have on the uh, fast media remote we saw a while ago get buttons for TV channels if your Packard Bell has a TV card in it an internet button, TV, FM, volume, all that good stuff and what's bizarre about this is it actually connects into the PS2 mouse port and you plug in your regular mouse into the media select right here so not sure how they accomplished that but hey it works so <laughs> This came um, standard with um, the Platinum series of Packard Bells in late 1996 and early 1997, so um, only a few of Packard Bells had these, so um, not the most necessary accessory to get in my opinion, but if you come across one of these for a good price, I'd say go ahead and give it a try. And of course I've got to mention the Packard Bell CRT monitors that were available at the time. This right here was the um, top of the line model that you could get. This is the 17 inch model. I believe it's the 3020. This particular one was manufactured in May of 1996. There was, there was also a analog 14 inch version and a digital 15 inch version. Both of them are I have in the house right now. This one um, has a, I believe a Trinitron display in it. Has a controls there. Now, um, getting a Packard Bell CRT monitor will probably not be the easiest thing for you to accomplish, uh, mainly because not only do these go for a lot of money on eBay, but it's a big risk shipping a CRT monitor in the mail or any kind of shipping service because it's hard to properly pack these, and shipping companies um, tend to... Um, uh, how do I put this? Play soccer with these things. <laughs> when I got this um, Packard Bell Legend 1510 Supreme that you're seeing right here back in uh, March of 2005, it originally came with a uh, 
I believe a 14 inch CRT Packard Bell monitor and the thing is this Packard Bell and the monitor only had uh, about 40 miles to travel to get to my house and UPS still seemed to find a way to um, destroy the monitor. When I got the monitor in the um, home it was just completely shot <laughs> even though it worked perfectly before it was sent my way so yeah um, best way to get a Packard Bell monitor is to get one locally that way you can drive it home yourself <laughs> so um, there was also one more uh, major Packard Bell accessory but I don't have one it's the uh, Packard Bell top drawer scanner which was um, basically a document scanner that would come with certain Packard Bell models in late 96 early 97 um, again I, I, I'd show it to you if I had one but um, that's an option if you're able to find one so now that you've got your Packard Bell all set up with all the hardware the software the um, keyboard mouse and other accessories what's there left to do well, simply enjoy the fruits of your labor. Install a game or two, um, type up a novel, because I'm going to be doing that someday on, on this computer, actually. So, I hope you enjoyed um, this um, Packer Bill's bu Packer Bill Buyer's Guide. I imagine um, I probably could have done better. <laughs> but there are a couple of little minor things that I want to add to the end of this um, CD-ROMs. If you find a Packard Bell with its original CD-ROM, um, there's a good chance that it'll probably not be working anymore um, because CD-ROMs on old computers, those are the first things to go out on you. So um, thankfully, these Packard Bells, they just use a IDE, a Tappy interface. Um, well, most of them, a few of the earlier ones, um, are a little bit picky about that. So you can just replace it with any um, IDE-based optical drive, and it, it should work just fine. Of course, if you use the um, Packard Bell um, software restore, you might not have the CD-ROM working right out of the box in MS-DOS, but there's uh, universal CD-ROM drivers that you can install for that with no problem. And you can also... Um, I'm also going to be uploading both of the uh, Packard Bell software collections that you saw in this video to archive.org. The, um, the uh, Restore CDs, the Master CDs, most of them are already on archive.org thanks to someone else. I will um, put a link to those in the description so you can grab those. And I guess that's um, about it once I finish this uh, Puzzle and the Incredible Machine. This is one of my favorite games of all times, folks. It's been a while since I've played this, so uh, have a little bit of patience for me, please. <laughs> there we go. So, I guess it'll about do it for this video. I hope you enjoyed it. Um, I'm sorry it took so long to get this done, but I hope it was well worth it for you guys. Until next time, this is Billy Core, signing off. Thank you for visiting the Nostalgia Mall. If you liked what you saw, please like, subscribe, and follow me on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. You can also support me on Patreon if you would like. The link to all of these are down below. Until next time, this is Billy Core signing off.